Carolina Insider is presented by Wells Fargo, official sponsor of Carolina Athletics. We're back. Time for another edition of the Carolina Insider. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm Jones Angel. He's Adam Lucas, and we, we've somehow done it again. We have another wonderful show upcoming here over the next 30 minutes or so. A lot of stuff to talk about. We'll look back at the football matchup with Virginia. Look ahead to the tussle with Duke coming at Wallace Wade Stadium at noon on Saturday. Our interview today is with Armando Baycott, Tar Heel sophomore, big a man, and we'll chat with Armando about the beginning of practice, the odd offseason, and more. Plus, we have our social drive as well. Show brought to you by Wells Fargo. When our communities need us, Wells Fargo is here to help. And Adam, unfortunately, a little bit of a familiar script in the game against Virginia this past Saturday as the Tar Heels, very similarly to Florida State, just too many mistakes to give themselves the best chance to win. And despite some really big offensive numbers, not punting in the ball game, Carolina falls by three. Yeah, it felt like if you had told us the stats before the game started for the Tar Heels, we would have felt pretty good about that outcome. But as Jones said, Carolina just too many mistakes, especially in special teams. And then defensively, just struggling to get off the field. Virginia goes four for four on fourth down against the Tar Heels. And Carolina just not able to stop them when it mattered and not able to, to make that last final drive to get a potential game winning score. So uh, tough weekend, tough game to lose to, to an ACC program that you feel like the Tar Heels would like to nudge ahead of in that race to follow up Clemson in the ACC. Felt like the sequence right before halftime was really important there when the Tar Heels muffed a punt. Virginia had a short field scored. Carolina went down to the to the lip of the cup but couldn't push it in. Yeah, and Carolina had already committed a penalty on that drive uh, to which penalties ended up being an important thing and also played a role there at the end as well because Carolina made a special teams miscue that led to a penalty kicking the ball out of bounds on the kickoff, which allowed Virginia to start further towards midfield. Perhaps if they start back at the 25 yard line, maybe they don't go for that last fourth down because they can't afford it so deep in their own territory. So just a case of Carolina shooting themselves in the foot too many times to win on the road, which has proven to be a struggle, but they'll get a chance to do it again here this weekend. There were some outstanding individual performances on the offensive side and Sam Howell, Deami Brown, both named ACC Player of the Week at their respective positions and easy to understand why. Howell with a career high 443 yards. That is the third highest single game total in Carolina history. And Adam Deami Brown, 11 catches for 240 yards, three touchdowns, the receptions and the yards, career highs for Diami. The touchdowns tied a career high. And in fact, the yard is the second most ever in a single game for Otario. And that's why you just hate it that Carolina didn't get that one last chance because it really felt like Sam Howell and Diami Brown could do pretty much whatever they wanted to do on offense. So you wanted them to get that one last shot because Diami Brown definitely having a breakout performance. Because of the nature of the game, Carolina was facing a big deficit in the second half from which the Tar Heels came back from. And then also just due to the fact that Virginia really crowded the box, was trying to stop the Tar Heels from running the football. You saw those big passing numbers. Michael Carter, Javante Williams did not have as big a stats in these games, but again, the course of the game dictated some of that. But that doesn't mean, Adam, that Michael Carter and, and Javante Williams, but we're gonna talk about Michael here particularly, isn't gaining some national attention. This is really positive news for Michael Carter's professional future as the Senior Bowl uh, tweeted out about him on Wednesday about how he's rising up draft boards, started on day three, he's played his way into a day two range. And I really think Jones being the draft expert that clearly I am, uh, I think once teams get a chance to see Michael Carter in person and especially to talk to him, oh, yeah. I think he's going to move up even more because AudioPod listeners know uh, from the Jake Lawler interview this week what an impact Michael Carter had with Jake Lawler and just what kind of person he is. And I think that'll end up mattering on draft day as well. Can do a lot of different things on the field, of course, run the ball, catch the ball good in special teams. That'll help him at the next level as well. So the next stop for the Tar Heels is Wallace Wade Stadium. Short drive over to Durham to see Duke. That is noon on Saturday. ESPN 2 for TV. Tar Heel Sports Network Radio Wise will be on the air at 11 a.m. And Adam, two things about this game that, that really stand out. One, Duke is uh, 
very good at disrupting things defensively, in particular on the end. They have two defensive ends, Chris Rumpf and Victor Dimukeji, both veteran players. They have combined for 18 tackles for loss and 15 sacks between those two players. Certainly something Carolina will have to be aware of. Well, and you feel like Virginia probably gave the blueprint to opposing defenses, which is stack the box, although Virginia did give up 41 points. It's not that great a blueprint, but you figure Duke will try to do the same thing. But the difference, as Jones just said, is Duke has a little bit better defensive ends than I think Virginia did. So they might be able to get pressure on that quarterback with just the line. So we'll have to see. Carolina offensive line has been a little up and down, need a little more consistency, especially in pass protection from that group this week over in Durham. Jones, a third thing about this game, it's at noon. Yeah. That's a dub. No <laughs> Tar worries. Tar Heels have been very comfortable at noon thus far. I, that's the third thing. The first thing was the, the pressure. I didn't even get to the second thing yet. And Adam, that's Duke has struggled with turnovers. 23 total turnovers lost by Duke. That is more than three per game on average. So you certainly keep that into consideration, but also Tar Heels can't go into this game assuming that they're going to get two, three, four turnovers. Well, and Duke's offense has not been good. Uh, quarterback Chase Bryce has been a little inconsistent, but Duke had an off week. They also had a big win over Charlotte, which is you're able to work some things out in a game like that. That's a game Carolina didn't get because it was canceled earlier this season, of course. Another thing that you worry about, perhaps balancing out those turnovers, Duke's been very sound in special teams. They've blocked some punts. Mm -hmm. They've really been good in that phase of the game, and we know Carolina has struggled in that area, so you can't afford to give back the turnovers you might get from them by committing special teams miscues. Again, that is noon on Saturday in Durham TV, ESPN2. Radio Wise will be on the air at 11 a.m. 107th meeting between Carolina and Duke, of course, the battle for the victory belt. All right, let's transition from football to field hockey and ACC tournament coming up. In fact, it starts today. It is being hosted in Chapel Hill by UNC. Carolina ACC regular season co-champions along with Louisville on the field hockey side of things. Tar Heels do compete this afternoon against Boston College at 4.30. And of course, Adam, uh, they are led by Erin Matson, somebody that we talk about a lot on this show because quite honestly, she's just probably the best player in the country. She won the Aaron Matson Award, <laughs> Offensive Player of the Week from the ACC. They just hand that out to Aaron Matson every week. It's kind of a tradition, uh, but well deserved, of course. Uh, leads the ACC in goals and assists. And thought this was a really cool play from Aaron Matson last weekend as uh, she, well, you'll be able to see it, but just the effort in this play and the skill is unbelievable as goes down to the ground, gets up before her defender ever stands up and scores a goal while her defender is still thinking what happened. That, that's just how good Aaron Matson is. That's like watching Mia Hamm Carolina video from 1987. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of Mia Hamm, women's soccer finished the regular season 9-0. and And Adam, that means uh, women's soccer team heading to the ACC tournament as well. As ACC regular season co-champions, along with Florida State, 24 regular season ACC titles for Anson Dorrance's team and unbeaten in their last 41 straight ACC games for women's soccer as they'll head to the ACC tournament. Yeah, that's in Cary. Action is Tuesday of this upcoming week. Carolina plays 530 against Virginia Tech. That's on the ACC network. By the way, we should have mentioned as well, field hockey, ACC tournament, all those matches will be broadcast on the ACC network. So if you're interested in watching some postseason action and some of these Olympic sports easily available on ACC network, if you don't have it and want it, get ACC in. Dot com. Adam, let's talk a little bit about some other sports that have wrapped up. That includes volleyball. They finished the fall season at 6-2 and two with a sweep of Virginia. Young team continuing to build. It's an unusual year as we know. There will be a spring season as well for volleyball. And congratulations to Asia, uh, Asia Buckner, ACC Freshman of the Week. And so we will hear from her and the Tar Heels a lot more as we 
come up here in the spring. Let's also talk a little men's soccer. That season coming to an end. Carolina's next action is Friday night against Duke. That is an 8 o'clock match. It is also on the ACC network. And if the Tar Heels are able to win that match, they will host an ACC tournament quarterfinal game. That would come up on November 15th. So an important match coming Friday night, Carolina and Duke. And Adam, last part, talk a little cross country. I want to keep talking about those programs with a great finishing kick. There, oh, nice. Cross country. Uh, Carolina freshman Sasha Neglia has just had an incredible year and has been named the freshman of the year. Uh, two other Tar Heels also named all ACC, but Sasha did it all fall along and named ACC freshman of the year. Great honor for her and for that program. So congratulations to Sasha. Congratulations to all these Tar Heel programs having terrific falls in what is, as we all know, a unique year for athletics and beyond. All right, let's get to our conversation with Armando Baycott. It is presented by Coca-Cola, which tastes better together. Coca-Cola, proud partner of Carolina Athletics. And Adam Armando gonna be a big part as, uh, not a big surprise, gonna be a big part of this Tar Heel front court that is pretty deep and pretty talented and a lot of competition in that Tar Heel front court about who's gonna get those minutes. It's gonna be interesting to see how that competition promotes some of the consistency that Armando was looking for. Couldn't always find last season. He's been really intense, really emotional in some of these early practices. We'll see if that carries on to better play on the court. And we will absolutely, the next time we talk to him, ask him to borrow Leaky Black's phone before he does the interview. <laughs> so let's get to our conversation with Tar Heel sophomore big man Armando Baycott. And don't forget, Social Drive coming up after this on the Carolina Insider. Our guest today has got a lot going on. He's got basketball practice has started back. He's been admitted to one of the presti most prestigious business schools in the entire United States of America, and he's on the Carolina Insider. So that's a lot going wow. on. Armando, thanks for making some time for us today. Thank you guys for having me. I'm really excited. Armando, uh, I like the hair, man. Is, is it longer than it has been before? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot long. It's covering my eyes and stuff. I barely can see y'all. <laughs> That's how most people like to watch the show. Just don't just don't look at y'all. Uh, what's going on, man? How you been? I've been good. I've been good just focusing on class, and that's basically it, and practice. Why was uh, being admitted to the business school important to you? Why was that something that you wanted to do? I mean, because it was one of the main reasons why I came here. I knew it was a prestigious business school, and I mean, a lot of the great leaders of this world attended the business school, and it's something I've been working for, and it's something I'm really into with both of my parents, um, both being business people. Uh, it was a huge accomplishment for me. Armando, how, how has this new world of doing class online, how, how has that been? What kind of adjustment has that been for you? I know you've been doing it for a while now, but what's that been like? I mean, it's been difficult just not being able to interact with my classmates and also being in there with my teachers and getting that hands-on learning. It's just a lot different online, but I mean, everything is different in this world we're in right now. How do you think it affected your summer and fall as a basketball player? How were you able to, to get work in and feel like you were making improvement for your sophomore year? Yeah, I mean, it's just been a lot different because, I mean, obviously we haven't been able to do, like, as many open gyms as we did last year. I mean, we got the season starting later. It's just you got to be more precautious with the things you do. So, I mean, it's been a lot different. Armando, you, you guys were able to, of course, work out some, not as much as you mentioned as you would like during the offseason. Practice now just getting going underway as well. Give, give us your thoughts on, on what the team is like. So many new faces this year for Carolina basketball. I mean, it's just a whole different energy. I mean, me, Garrison, and KJ were talking the other day, like, when we were having, like, our open runs, I mean, it's just so much more competitive. You got guys talking trash in the group chat <laughs> the day before, like, us doing seven-game series. Um, Adam, I know you saw it, just, like, how competitive it is. It's just a way different competitiveness in the gym and just a different feeling. Okay, so since you mentioned it, let's talk about that competitiveness. You and four freshmen – took on yeah. some upperclassmen in a seven game series and you fell behind and then, then you went, well, yeah, I wasn't gonna do you like that. <laughs> then you went on a little winning streak, which I'm sure you'll point out was four in a row. There yeah. was some chit chat as those games were being played. There was some Armando putting on some sick post moves. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that day and what it says about this team as a competitive group. 
I mean, like I was saying to the younger guys, I mean, it just showed a lot of fight and resilience and us just going down 3-0 to the older guys. I mean, obviously Garrison was doing his thing. Playtech wasn't missing any shots. KJ controlling the floor. We went down huge, but we said to ourselves, hey, we got to go on a four-game winning streak to win because we knew it would be tough for us in the locker room if we got swept or even lost because we were talking so much junk. So <laughs> we came back to show resilience from the freshmen. I mean, they've been great. Um, Caleb, he's been really good. RJ, Dayron, I mean, he a beast on the boards. I mean, I thought I was pretty good on the boards my freshman year, but God dang, that boy, he know how to get to the boards. I got to give it to him. I, I was going to ask you about that. So th not to suggest that there wasn't competition in the post last year, but now you're down there, Garrison's down there, you've got two walkers down there, Walker Kessler and Walker Miller, you've got Dayron down there. Now what, what is a practice like or a workout session like when you've got all these big bodies all trying to do the same thing? I mean, it's just so fun and so competitive. I mean, just with our big man rotation this year, we won't be able to play against bigs as good as us this year. So most of our competition will be in practice. And the fact we get to play against each other every year will make the game so much easier. I mean, I was having a conversation with Walker Kessler yesterday, and he like, man, college is hard. And I'm like, yeah, it's hard in practice, but I don't think it'll be this much harder in the game. You mentioned Dayron's rebounding. You're somebody who got a ton of rebounds as a freshman. What is it about him that, that makes him such a good rebounder? I mean, first, he's just so big. I mean, he's like 265 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's a big guy. He's athletic, and he got a good knack for the ball. Like, he always in the right position to know where to get to, and he just doesn't stop on the boards. How about Walker Kessler, since we're asking you about other guys right now, Armando? He just, yeah, Walker Kessler, he's he a big dude. Yeah, I mean, he's so he, tall. He'll have a shot on him, and he'll just um, come out of nowhere and just block it, I mean. And he got a good shot. He got good touch, great skill. They both would be good guys for us. Armando, the NBA draft is coming up next month, and there was some chatter about Cole Anthony recently that you chimed in on. I yeah. wonder why was that important for you to speak up, and what was the message you were trying to get across? Yeah, I mean, it was huge for me. I mean, because it's just been this thing that Cole is like a bad teammate or um, – just like a cancer in the locker room, man. And it's not true. I mean, obviously last year was tough for us. And he was one of those guys that would just try to lift us up, try to get us in the gym early before practice and just always trying to encourage us. So, I mean, I just know it's not fair for him. And I know it's probably just somebody trying to put out bad information. I don't know, I guess to drop his stock or something. So, I mean, I just had to speak up for my guy. Armando, it, it seems like it was forever ago, but, but last year did not go the way that, that you wanted or anybody around Carolina basketball wanted. Now that you've had some time to, to move away from that, what do you think you guys learned from that experience that hopefully will help you this season and moving forward? I mean, just not taking nothing from granted. I mean, I feel like me personally, I took a lot of stuff for granted last year. And just as a team, this year, I mean, we pissed off, to be honest with you, like, Everybody that laughed at us this year, we'll see how they look at us this year. <laughs> well, last year, we'll see how they look at us this year. Coach Williams always says that he really likes having a talented team that feels like they're the underdog. Yeah. Is that kind of how you feel going into the season that hopefully is going to start in about a month or so? Definitely. I mean, we love where we're at right now. We want to be the underdogs just to wake everybody up. Armando, so – the beginning of practice, I'd just be interested in, in your thoughts from a year ago, the first couple of practices, to this year, the first couple of practices, maybe both individually and as a team. Do you think that they're more advanced now than they were a year ago, or have you noticed any difference when you're talking about early season practices? Definitely, I would say we're more advanced now. I mean, the way we run the floor is just so much better. The guards were pushing it. We're a lot better shooting team this year. I mean, you get the better version of everybody last year, me, Garrison, KJ, and all the rest of the returners, Leaky. You get a better version of us, and then you bring in a talented group of newcomers, too. I mean, it's been great. And I feel like we're talented all around the floor, bigger, athletic. So, yeah. What does Armando Baycott know about playing the post for Roy Williams right now that he didn't know last year at this time? I mean, I just found out more like the smaller things I didn't do, like getting positioned earlier, creating contact first, just those little things that make it a lot easier for me. I've learned that through playing a year of college basketball. Don't want to keep you too much longer, Armando, but last season you had some games, spectacular games, the game against Oregon in the Bahamas, and there, there are a lot of other examples. I, I'm guessing you wanted to be more consistent, though. You wanted to be closer to that level more often. How does that happen in year two for you? 
I mean, like I said, just not taking anything for granted, just preparing myself, going out there, trying to keep the same mind every game and just, yeah, just not taking anything for granted, playing hard every play and just trying to win and will my team to a victory. Armando, what's, uh, what's your thought on the semi-bubble life that you uh, might be leading this year uh, with, with basketball? Have you given any thought to it or what it might be like? I mean, as a team, we've all been bubbling already, so we kind of prepare for it. We've just been sticking with each other mainly, so it's just different. It's obviously sad for me just not being able to interact with just my different classmates and friends all around campus, but, hey, everything comes with a cost. <laughs> It's hard to believe it is that time of year again. It's almost time for Carolina basketball. I'm ready. Me too. So is he. Ready. It only really matters. If Most he's importantly, ready, yeah. Armando's ready. Armando, man, great to see you as always. Really looking forward to the upcoming season. Appreciate you giving us some time today. Got you. Thank y'all for having me. Appreciate Armando's time and look forward to seeing him and the Tar Heels on the court. We think on November 25th. We don't actually have a schedule. We'll guess November 25th in the Smith Center for the Tar Heels. If they don't show up, you and I yeah. can just go yeah. and we'll play and some of y'all show up and we'll have a pickup game on November 25th and they'll probably put it on the ACC network. And I want Armando on my team if we're doing that. All right, let's get to the social drive and we start off, Adam, I was wondering. Uh, we I start, got excited. We start off by going back actually to last week, Halloween, of course, and some Tar Heel teams had some fun, including women's soccer we have some video of that and adam a, a lot of different looks here uh, from the women's soccer team as they go through some fun halloween costumes i always come away with the impression from carolina women's soccer social media that it would be a lot of fun to be on that team they just seem like they like each other they have a good time there's some pretty good costumes here including some folks making fun of former podcast heather o'reilly yeah but it's always it good fun because it's halloween Heather always brings her dog to practice. She was recently gave birth, so I think that was a pregnant Heather O'Reilly. There's Adam. He loves TikTok. We know that. <laughs> so uh, a lot of... There, there, you could have been in that one. That was Harry Potter. Yep, that's right. We added a Harry Potter theme in the Angel family this year. So uh, a lot of fun for women's soccer on Halloween as they celebrated this past week. And Adam, some celebration in the Yankee household as well as uh, Mandy Yankee sent us this tweet. See, that's Roy Williams Yankee, not Roy Williams the coach. Yeah. Roy Williams Yankee is the dog. Right. And you can tell because of the glasses yep. that that's Roy Williams. Yep. And I guess also the mask that's been added for 2020. Uh, so it looks like they had a good celebration. Roy Williams, Yankee the dog, has both his tennis shoes and his chalkboard, so he's ready to go. And a new family member there as well, so congratulations to everybody. Hope you had fun on Halloween. And someone who we always, uh, just from our experience in the past with him, knows that he has a lot of fun is Mac Collins. And Adam, this is A-plus content right here on the costume from Mac. Well, I think what makes it so good is it's not like he had to put in a ton of effort. We got the hoodie. He had to go find the alien and then the blanket to put around the alien. And you got your E.T. costume. Yeah. But I, I think that's pretty good. He just looks like he believes it. That's high quality there from Mac, no doubt. And also providing some high quality uh, play on the field are Mac Collins and other Tar Heels at the NFL level. And always enjoy doing this. And we've had a lot of opportunities to do this this year. And that show you some of those guys having success and finding the end zone. And this past week, Eric Ebron, a big score for the Steelers and their big win over the Ravens. And Giovanni Bernard hit Pater twice in the Cincinnati Bengals victory over Tennessee. Let's take a look and listen. Decreasing your chances of taking a shot to the end zone. Bernard, right on cue, and he's in for the touchdown. Trying to build on a 10 point lead. Second and goal. Burrow, near side, Bernard, touchdown. So good stuff there from Ebron and Gio Bernard. And Adam, speaking of Gio, you guys are Twitter buddies. Yeah, essentially we hang out all the time. We mentioned Geo last week because it was the eight week anniversary, uh, eight week, eight year anniversary of the punt return against NC State. If you're wondering, does Geo remember all his Tar Heel friends? Look, he does indeed. Beyond thankful for his Carolina family. So great to see that from Geo and hope maybe he can get back to Chapel Hill at some point once his touchdown scoring time for the Bengals is over this fall.
And Adam, the original part of that tweet also was linking an old story that you had written about Gio, a really good one about just his journey to, to getting to Carolina. Well, because Gio has an incredible story, not because it was some sort of fantastic writing, but... Oh, we Gio, all understand if, that. If, if you, <laughs> everybody knew that without you mentioning it. Uh, if you don't know Gio's background and just how he came to America and his whole family story, definitely worth a read to, to get to love him even more than you probably already do. All right, let's head to baseball. Of course, the major league season just ending a couple of days ago. And one Tariel who had a terrific year was former uh, audio podcast guest Zach Gallon. And if you're interested in hearing that conversation, we talked to Zach back on February 11th of 2020. It's such a, it was a simpler time than in February 11th of 2020. But we enjoyed our conversation with Zach. And Adam, Zach enjoyed his season. What a terrific year for Zach Gallon. And really encourage you to vote in this uh, for the all MLB team. You can actually vote every single day. This would be huge for Zach Gallen's career. And in all honesty, this isn't just a gift vote you're giving him. He had the kind of year that justifies it. Wasn't on a great team, but his performance was excellent. So if you get a chance to, to head over there and vote for him for all MLB, that'd be big. MLB.com slash all MLB. And you can vote right there's the slash you can vote uh for zach gallon and all the positions there for all major league baseball all right adam let's finish up with some basketball stuff and uh you're our french master so i'll let you uh, <laughs> i'll let you explain this first clip well so marcus ginyard as we all know is one of the nicest guys not just in the united states but in all the world and marcus has had a very successful career playing overseas and he currently is on a multi-year contract in limoges france and what this says right here, using my French to English dictionary is, Marcus Guignard in Limoges, he is the mayor. Yeah. So they're calling him the mayor uh, there because he's really made an effort to get to learn French and get to know that town, which is exactly what you would expect from Marcus Guignard, a multiple time audio podcast guest, always enjoy talking to him. He also is featured in the new issue of Born and Bred, which is the Rams Club magazine, just talking about kind of how he weathered the pandemic over in France. Uh, so really encourage you as always to join the Rams Club so you can get that magazine, read more about Marcus, Dion Thompson, some of the other Tar Heels abroad. Adam, in what I consider a big upset, we have a Fran Fraschilla tweet here <laughs> on the Carolina Insider, and that is because... That We've got is, a, how can you justify that on the <laughs> video pod? That is because he uh, highlighted some Dean Smith coaching tips, which are always good to follow, and uh, some good ones there uh, from, from Coach Smith that Fran highlighted. This really was cool. It's a worthwhile tweet to look at. I had not seen this book before that I guess he's pulling from. Uh, on the next page of this book, it talks about how Fran Fraschilla thinks Roy Williams is really overrated and not much of a coach. But this page is really good and highly recommend that you check that one out because Fran Fraschilla, like most of us, is right about one out of every two times. Yeah. That was one of his one times he was right. Speaking out of one out of two times, there's been an election this week. Don't know if you heard that <laughs> or not. And Adam, that reminded us of a time, gosh, was it really back in, that was what, 12 years ago now, where then President Barack Obama came and joined the Tar Heels uh, and shot around with some practice. There you see it, it was in April of 2008. And you know, whatever political party you are a part of or support, you have to admit, it's pretty cool that the sitting president at the time came and shot some hoops with the heels. And this was actually when he was a senator who was going to run for president. And it turned out that Barack Obama and the Tar Heels had a really close relationship uh, when the Tar Heels visited the Smith Center. President Obama was the sitting president. And as Jones said, no matter what your feeling is about that particular president, the office of the president and the chance to be that close to it and the, the feeling you get when you're in its presence is something you don't forget and something that I know that 2009 team really enjoyed and appreciated about getting to go to Washington and meet President Obama individually and then have a ceremony in the Rose Garden. That was a day none of them are going to forget. And that day when he was just a, just a pickup basketball player hooping it up in the practice gym uh, was really fun for everybody involved. All right, a reminder again, Carolina football back on the field. It is Saturday at noon, short drive over to Wallace Wade Stadium in Durham, the 107th meeting between Carolina and Duke. But for now, we say goodbye. Thanks for joining us on the latest edition of the Carolina Insider. See you later, Big Grit.